Hi there, welcome. Welcome to Home Keepers. Hey, grab yourself a cup of tea and stay with us. We have a great program for you. And if you're brand new, I want you to know you're so welcome. I hope you can feel the hugs we're sending your way and hope that it won't be your last time with us. And uh, I never ever want to neglect those regular viewers that we hear from frequently. Uh, we feel like your family and sometimes we're on the phone with you or we receive a really sweet note. I want you to know every bit of it is appreciated. Well, you're going to hear a story today that still kind of has me like, could it really happen? Um, you know, we read in the Bible about when God gives a promise and it's a long, long time before it's fulfilled. Well, this is kind of a modern day promise to go from God, um, something he wants this family to do. And it took 10 years. As, as I went through the book, I just started getting exhausted. And you wonder, especially in our, you know, society of everything instant and technical and you push a button and it's right there. 10 years is a long time for a promise. But I, I really hope you will get the book uh, of the gentleman I'm going to talk to because it's going to teach you so many things really about waiting on the Lord and about how he speaks and all. And this is the book, We Believed. And it's the story of Jeffrey Moore and his wife. One son and God kind of laid on their hearts to uh, have an international adoption, maybe one child, one girl. And how in the world they ended up with four siblings out of an orphanage in Peru. It is a journey, and I want you to hear all about it, and you're going to meet uh, Jeffrey Moore in a few minutes. Uh, after I join Stephanie, and we fix a vegetarian linguine. Now, this is an educational moment. I wanted to call it Susan's vegetarian linguine. And she she's, no, she said, I'm not a vegetarian, I'm a vegan. And there's a difference. Now, where are you gonna learn that, except right here on Homekeepers? So the vegan has absolutely no animal substances like eggs or cheese or anything like that. So now you know. Aren't you glad you tuned in? Before I join her, though, let me tell you again about so He Holds My Hand by Carol Kent. You're used to Carol being on this program. And as I told you earlier, I started through this this year because I always do devotionals of some kind. This one is a superior devotional. And it contains words of people perhaps you've heard of, great Christians, great writers. It also has writings by Carol, and it also ends up with a scripture, all on the same page for the same day. I read it this morning before I came to work. So it's yours for that gift of at least $20 to the program. You can see what a beautiful book it is. In fact, if you're like Stephanie and you do your Christmas shopping way ahead of time, you could order a bunch of these and have a lot of your Christmas shopping out of the way. And I'm telling you, this is a lifetime gift. It's something you'll probably repeat maybe next year and the next year. So use your, 800, your credit card, 800-229-0059, or Homekeepers, Box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758. And as we're here this day, we are in the month of April. Uh, many people have said they've never, ever seen a year go by so fast. That, it is flying by. But this is the girl who Christmas shops all year. So how are so, you doing now? I, it's so funny because I was just thinking this, how excited I am to be, because, you know, when I was going through the breast cancer, that it just dominated everything. Mm -hmm. I didn't focus. I couldn't focus. Certainly I was not Christ on Christmas in no, April. <laughs> and I wasn't Christmas shopping and everything. And, and that just threw my whole world off because that's what makes me happy, you know. Mm -hmm. And now this year I'm on a roll. I am on a roll for very personalized, great Christmas presents, and I'm excited. Absolutely, yes. and and, you and people say, "Oh my gosh, I don't want to hear this." Okay, but listen, it's it's going to come. Christmas, Christmas comes every single year, mm -hmm. right? And why shop at the last minute if you don't have to? Why? Yes, and also you spread it out. You're not maxing out that one credit right. card. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I'm paying cash mm -hmm. all along the way, mm -hmm. and when Christmas comes by November. The end of November, I will be done, and I will be able to enjoy the holidays. And you will be the happiest. Yes. So. Okay, so. There's I'm, no end to what you can learn on this program. Right. I have butter and oil in here. I should have been doing this already. I'm okay. so sorry. Okay, I have zucchini and mushrooms I'm going to put in here, okay? And we're going to saute. 
Are you thrilled to know the difference between a vegan and a vegetarian, or did you already know that? Yeah, I knew that. Oh, you knew Because I, I, when I saw this recipe, I went through it, and I thought, okay, the cheese. We, we wouldn't be able, she wouldn't be able to have the cheese. So, so we'll, we took her name off of it. So we took her name, well, if we took the cheese out, yeah, it could be. It would be okay. Yeah, so I'm just going to saute up some zucchini and some mushrooms. All The recipe will be on the screen at the end, so you can get it like that. You can get it through the mail. Mm -hmm through the email, or if you go on, if you're on Facebook, you can go on my fan page, Stephanie's fan page, and I post the recipes every single day now. Yes, I, you need to get on her fan page, because that's single a fun day. one. Now, I just chopped up some fresh basil, and it must be God's most fragrant. Oh, there's nothing like just, fresh herbs. I mean, you put a knife to that, and it just... Mm, so good. Mm. Okay, so I'm sauteing zucchini and mushrooms. I'm going to put in... A tomato. Look at oh, that. This Look is going to be vegetables. so good. Scallion, green onion, garlic, garlic, which I'll tell you this, I would put a lot more garlic. Uh -huh. This is, they call for one clove. Oh, I would amp that Another up. moment of education. I was yes. telling her this morning. Do you know the garlic capital of the world? And I'll salt bet and pepper. You don't. It's Gilroy, California. And my sister and I drove through there once. She lives in Northern California, so she's the one who educated me. But I mean, it was, it smelled. Like deep. when you drove through there, right? You could smell Roll it. the windows down and yes. that's all it, mm. Yes, we did. So that's Gilroy, That would California. probably make me hungry all the time. Uh -huh. I would just stay hungry. You couldn't live there, could you? No. Although, I'm sure they probably get used to it. Like, we get used to everything, you know, here, mm -hmm. all the smells. I'm sure you get, but. Boy, we've been an educational. Seriously, where else can you get this? <laughs> oh, that looks wonderful. Oh, my gosh. Just like that. Just like this, yes. Just a vegetable saute. So we, we're using linguine. You know what surprised us? It called for six ounces. So this really has more vegetables in it than pasta. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and I think your, that's the your, point. Your regular box of uh, pasta is about 16 ounces. Yeah. I think that's the point. So the cheese is not going to go in it. It's going to go, we're going to put a little bit on ours so that Susan can also have okay, some. Okay. Okay. And they don't like calls for it to go on it anyway. It mm -hmm. doesn't call for it to go in it. So yeah, but what about the provolone? We're, nope, none of it goes. Do, okay, no, we're, not. They, they only call for it to go on top along with the basil. Okay. It doesn't go in it. Okay. Yep. So we won't put it on. I'll put it on my plate, and then Susan will have some. Yes, yay. exactly. <laughs> she just raised. So her you hands want this said, to go yay. a lot longer, okay? Although, mm -hmm. although you like your um, vegetables crunchy, so that's I what do. you're getting yeah. today yeah. for sure. That's why we're getting them. Yeah, let so me I'm get. I'm just going to put a little Parmesan on mine, but it, it yeah. does call for provolone and basil. And right. basil, oh yes. Uh, here we go. I'm not going to try to do that with a Have spoon. you ever heard a story like our guest today? No. This, uh, Stephanie already met him. Yes, let me do a couple. It was kind of like reading an Old Testament story, going on a journey. And... There you go. Let's okay. do a little oh, boy. herb. You do Parmesan. And we'll give uh, oh, Mr. Morrison if he does a good job. If he does a good job. <laughs> so good. Mm -hmm. oh, Would wonderful. you up the the garlic? Would you up the garlic? Can you taste yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can ever have too much mm -hmm. garlic. So. Mm -hmm. So good, right? That's one of the best things we've ever fixed. And for all you busy, busy ladies, look how easy. So. So easy. It's called vegetarian linguine, and recipes free. Information's coming up on your screen. We'll be glad to get it out to you. But right now, I want you to meet my guest, Jeffrey Moore. You're going to enjoy him. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, you may receive it by contacting us through social media as listed on the screen. When requesting a copy through the mail, be sure to include a self-addressed stamped envelope. Thank you, and please know we always appreciate hearing from our viewers. All right, meet my new friend, uh, Jeffrey Moore, author of We Believed and one of the most, you know, amazing is such an overused word. Oh, there's very few things that are really amazing, but I would say this story is in that category. So welcome, and thank you for the book. Thank you so much, yes. it's a pleasure to be here. Yes, I, I think the first thing I said to you was you sure married the right woman. <laughs> I did, there's no doubt about that. My wife, Christine, is amazing. This is like an odyssey. Um, 
uh, it would make a good movie, really, really. I, I've been told that by several people. Mm -hmm. I really have. It's very well, interesting. Well, there, there's so many things, and I know my viewers, there's so many, there's so many questions about something like this. Uh, you were raised in a Christian home, right? I was. Mm -hmm. That's right. But at some point, you know, not, not everybody who's raised in a Christian home is kind of taught or somewhere you're led to listen to the voice of the Lord, and that's a big subject. That's true. It really is. Um, you know, in the early days, I was confident of my salvation. I knew I was saved. I've always known that. But I didn't feel like I could hear God's voice, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. or a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And I kind of had to learn that as I went. And I began to just cry out. It was really in college and a little bit after college that I started to, to cry out to him and say, Lord, I, I think there's more, and I, I want that more. You know, I want to be hearing your voice. And I had to have some training in how to hear God's voice. And it turned mm -hmm. out that I was hearing his voice a lot more than I realized that I was. And hearing it but not recognizing it? Yes, exactly. Hearing it but not recognizing it. And one of the differences is, you know, when we talk to each other, the sound goes into our ear first and then goes to our brain and then the brain communicates it to our spirit. But when God speaks to us, he's not a man, he's a spirit. And he speaks to our spirit first and that's where the message is received and then it gets communicated to the brain. And so when I got the call for this uh, adoption that we did, um, I first got it in my spirit and my spirit just was like, alive. It was like, oh my goodness, yes, I want to do that. That's exactly what I want to do. And then the message went to my brain and I thought, oh, what in the world? <laughs> That's where a lot of them stop, right? Exactly, exactly. I don't, I don't know anything about adoption. I've never adopted before. What does this mean? What does it look like? And so I had to get my brain in line with my spirit and say, okay, God has called me to this. Um, he's going to provide. He's going to show us the way. And no matter how long it takes, if we keep following him, He's going to be the one that um, helps to uh, make the way for us and, and smooth out the path in front of us. Now, you had one son. Mm -hmm. His name's Joshua. That's At right. that time, when you first knew you were to adopt, That's how right. old was he? He was just three years old. Uh, we got this call in 2007 when I first had a vision that God gave me about the adoption. And he was just three years old, so he's uh, almost 15 now. So this is a part has been a part of his life for his whole life. We've been talking about adoption and talking about adding siblings to our family. Yeah, because as I was reading it, I was concerned about him. Yes. You know. Uh, now, what about your wife? Were you on board first, and then she came on, or did she receive a message from the Lord? God was speaking to us at the same time in different ways. Um, we had this month of May in 2007. And we, really, she had decided to seek the Lord in a different way and uh, to get up in the middle of the night and, and seek Him in the night hours for the month of May. And so I decided to join her. Really, I was just going to do it for a day or so. Um, but the time was so rich with the Lord that I just began to continue. And in that month, I had this vision. And in the book, I talk all about the vision and I share all the details. I'll just give you the short summary uh, right now. And uh -huh. that is, um, in this vision... I was floating in the ocean at night. It was a dark scene, but there was a moon in the scene. It was a little bit of light. And I was being carried by something in the water. Uh, and I came up onto the beach of a small, deserted, tropical island. And on that island, on the, laying on, all over the sand in the beach, was the most amazing thing. There were all of these jewels, or gemstones. Mm -hmm. Now, these weren't the size like in an engagement ring. These were the size of like a golf ball. And they were enormous. And they were glowing with an internal fire. So all of, there are all of these points of light all over the beach. Mm -hmm. And I reached down to pick up the first one. And the vision ended. And the Lord said this to me. He said, my son, are you willing to be carried by my spirit to a land far away to pick up the jewels that no one else even knows about? And in that moment, he kind of pulled back the curtain of heaven. And he showed me a picture of what our future was going to be like. And I knew that those jewels were children in another country that he was calling us to go and to pick up those jewels, to bring those children into our family and give the fatherless a home. I would think without that, you never would have made it. Without that supernatural, and maybe think people are looking, are you kidding me, you know? But um, God does work like that. I know in he my does. own life, and it's so rare. You, you don't live like this all the time. You, you, you don't have a great vision every day. <laughs> I, exactly right. <laughs> right. And, but I remember one thing, one encounter with God when I was quite young. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> if I ever had a moment of kind of want to go off the rails or whatever, 
nothing could take that away mm -hmm. from me. I knew he was real. Exactly. And I would think this journey you're about to take, if you hadn't had that totally supernatural experience, trust me, you never, never would have done it. I think that's exactly right. Because the journey took so long, uh, and really journeys are long, I think, because God is as interested in our character as he is in the end point of the mm -hmm. journey. We get so focused on the end point, the destination. Yeah. Where are we going? How do we get there? Uh, but God is concerned about he's our in character. The, he's in the process. He's in the process. Exactly right. He's now, uh, <clears throat> some, uh, I want to tell you, he's going to be on the next program because this is such a big story mm -hmm. and uh, a, a lot of information that he can give us that's not really all that personal uh, because uh, you knew it was an international adoption. Mm -hmm. and. Yeah, we hear of people going to the Ukraine or somewhere and they adopt, but we have no clue what they go through. And kind of a battle of the nations. It's, it's Children very interesting. Children they'd like to get rid of or whatever, but mm -hmm. they're going to make it hard for you. Uh, yes, yes, so that's true. So you really thought there would be one child, a daughter? Yes. And your wife, you thought that? Mm -hmm. At the beginning, that was our thinking. Um, we knew that, that girls around the world tend to be marginalized uh, more than boys. Um, and there's some various reasons for that in different mm -hmm. countries. But we, our heart was really for girls. That's what God put on our heart at the beginning. And um, we prayed about that. And we were looking for a group of girls, a sibling group of girls, for many years. Um, but as we continued to, to put the puzzle pieces together with the Lord, He put on our heart that it wasn't just girls, that there was a boy involved as well. And so we ended up adopting three girls and one boy uh, from Peru. And they were siblings. There's something really special about that. Yeah. Something, thank God they weren't separated. Well, your first, uh, and I would say you are a scientist? Mm -hmm. Yep, I was a petroleum geologist for 20 years in my early career. Which gave you um, at least some of the financial means to, to do this. And I didn't tell you, he's from Colorado. I was born in Colorado. I spent my first 18 years there. And it'll always be home. Mm -hmm. It's just gorgeous, just a beautiful state. Have it, you gone skiing it there? Is. And all that? We don't ski much. No, mm -hmm. we're more of summer, summer Colorado people. But mm -hmm. we've been there for 20 years, mm -hmm. and uh, we love it. It's a really great place. It's where the Lord has us. Yes, I, growing up there, you know, I could sing their anthem, but all I, right. won't, I won't. <laughs> all right. Uh, first place you went to was Africa. Mm -hmm. That's right. Was it like a great shock? just to see the, what an orphanage life is like there. It was, and we got a chance to visit a number of orphanages there uh, in the country of Burkina Faso in West Africa. And the one that we stayed at was a Christian orphanage and called Sheltering Wings in the city of Yako. And it was a beautiful place. And uh, the lady that ran that, Ruth Cox, um, she did an amazing work. I mean, she basically moved to Africa on her own. She started the orphanage. Is she American? She was American, yes, and God she. God bless her. Yes, oh my goodness. I, I, absolutely. She started the orphanage. She started a food distribution program for widows, um, a medical clinic, a school. Uh, um, amazing work that she's doing there. And so we partnered with her, and we went and we stayed at her orphanage. Um, we helped her with things there at the orphanage and in the community. But she also took us to some other orphanages as well that were not, um, that were state run or run by other organizations. And um, I tell you, there are some very, very difficult. Um, situations that orphans especially uh, find themselves in, in other countries. And what were the conditions like? Um, well, I'll tell you, in one, pl in one place, not in Ruth's orphanage, but in one of the, the poorer places, um, my oldest son, son, Joshua, who was three at the time and went with us, um, he was walking around the courtyard and picking up things that he knew were dangerous, like rusty knife blades and used batteries and things like that, and giving them to me because at three he knew Smart. that there were things that were not safe for the other kids there in that environment. Um, it, was, it was terrible. Also, it's not as easy as you might think that, was it in Africa where the children had to be abandoned? before they were eligible for adoption. Uh, yes, that's, that's true. They had to be, um, their, if their parents are alive, they have to make a decision you know, that they are not able to care for the children and then they give them up for adoption. Um, we did find interesting things about orphanages in other countries and that is there are children in orphanages that actually are not adoptable. Um, their parents, for example, uh, let's say a mother and father are married, they, they have a child, the mother dies in childbirth and the father has no means to care for um, the baby or milk and so he may send the child to an orphanage to be cared for for a year or two until he either remarries 
for... Um, and can he visit, like visit? Oh, yes, again? yes, yeah. But that child's not adoptable. That child will eventually, hopefully, go back to um, their parents or their father, you know, in the, in the Wasn't community. Wasn't there one African child you thought you might adopt? There was, yes. You know, when I first got this call, I like to, to look at dreams and visions and prophetic words like puzzle pieces. And we got this puzzle piece of the adoption. And we got one about Africa, about going to Africa as a family. And so I took those and I just jammed them together and said, okay, here we go. We're going to Africa. We're going to adopt. And we told everyone that. We told our family, our friends, our pastor, um, that we thought we might come back from this two-week trip uh, with an adopted child. And of course we went and we came back and we did not adopt. We never connected with um, a child that we thought you know, really was um, uh, able to be adopted. The one that we at one point thought might be a, uh, a good fit for our family uh, was in that situation I mentioned earlier. She was not adoptable because she actually had family in the community. Okay, at that point did you think Okay, I've gone to Africa and I've done all that. Maybe I didn't get the first message right. I absolutely did. Really? Yeah. You know, honestly, it took almost a year for me to process that spiritually and mentally to keep, keep going back and saying, you know, Lord, okay. Well, at first I said, I think I missed it. I, I obviously, you know, either this vision was not from the Lord or mm -hmm. I missed it somehow. That was my first thought. And then I just kept going back to that vision. I kept praying about it and taking it to the Lord. And, and I finally realized he said, nope, you didn't miss it. It's not done yet. It's still in the future. In fact, at that time, it was still far in the future, much further than I realized it was going to be. But yes. Yeah, it, it took so long. Um, I'm sure there were a lot of places where you kept revisiting that and say, you know, did, did I really get it right? We did. I like that vision that you mentioned having, you know, as a child. Um, having that vision at the beginning, that supernatural experience from the Lord was, was key. But then we had, we had friends uh, and family that encouraged us along the way. We have a great um, group of friends, you know, from our church and, and otherwise in the, in the community that really at key times, God would bring the right person into our life, you know, and say, look, just keep going, keep seeking him, keep having that faith and combine it with, with patience like Hebrews 6, 12 talks about, you know. He is, he is in the details. Um, yes. There's just an expression, the devil's in the details. That's not true. I agree with that. God, yeah, God is in the details. Uh, if anybody knows yeah. that, you do. <laughs> That's uh, right. You know it better than any of us. Um, and you always thought it would be one child. We did at the beginning, although, you know, interestingly, there were multiple jewels, you know, on the sand in that original uh, vision that I had. But, but the thought that I had at the beginning was it would be one child. I had no grid for adopting multiple children mm -hmm. uh, at that point. And I think, honestly, if God had said... Uh, I want you to adopt four kids at the very beginning. Yeah, say something else. <laughs> I, I probably would have ran, you know, uh -huh. and said, oh, we just can't do that. That's just not possible. And it took time for him to really get that concept into our uh, minds and our hearts and just really give us his heart for the, for the fatherless. Now, what was your wife through like this? I know you vacillated, and I'm sure she did, mm -hmm. but did you ever at the same time? Um, Yes, there were a few times. Yes, that at the same time we were both That's saying, bad. I don't know, I don't know. But you know, when you wait, waiting can be so hard because we, you know, particularly in our, in our society today, we, everything is instant, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it just, things happen so, so quickly. And waiting is not something that I think we're geared for, you know, in our spirits, no, in our we're souls. We're used to clicking the mouse. We are, exactly. And we get what we want, you know, most of the time. And so, yeah, there were some times we both said, it's taking so long we don't know if it's going to be possible. I mean, we knew that Abraham and Sarah were, you know, well past childbearing age when they had a child. But when you talk about international adoption, most countries have laws uh, concerning the age of parents. Yeah, and I was, uh, I was thinking of those Old Testament stories. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, in the New Testament, there were time frames mm -hmm. for a lot of things. And that's, right. that's pretty hard uh, for uh, Americans. You have a term in there... Uh, about spiritual preparation. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many of we Christians, and certainly can include me, run past that. Mm. Uh, the, I think the that's, spiritual preparation. I, I, think I know we how to clean to. a house. I know how to pack. I know how to do anything. Yes. But the spiritual preparation is uh, getting alone with God, and Americans are always running too much. Yes. You know, I, I recently said in a, in a sermon that I preached, I said, you know, if, if you want to hear God's voice, you're going to have to slow down and get quiet. 
you know, like Elijah did in the cave, the still small voice. If you're putting God in with your Twitter feed, you know, you're probably going to miss his, his voice uh, when it goes by. You really have to take time uh, to listen and to, uh, to slow down a little bit. And for something like this, this big, um, y you really mess up if you, if you don't take the time mm -hmm. to really hear from God and try to run mm -hmm. past Him. Mm -hmm. um, so you, did you go to India also? So you've been to we Africa did. and that mm -hmm. was a no, no, nothing. That's right. So you go to India. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, when we came back from Africa, like I said, it took about a year to really kind of get back on track with the Lord and His plans for us. Um, and then another year or two went by and we started the, the physical process of adoption, like the home study process. We had to move houses because the house we were in was not big enough to add a sibling group. By that time, we felt like that. But you were th still thinking of international. We were still thinking international, mm -hmm. but by that time we were thinking sibling group. Mm -hmm. And so the house we had was not big enough for that. So we actually bought a bigger house in 2012 and moved into it. So we'd be prepared oh, to I... make room for this, um, for this adoption. You're giving us a lot of Boy, a lot of teaching here. You know, you get the spiritual, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then sometimes there's just the natural, normal, physical of yes. carrying out the spiritual. There is. You know, I've heard it said, uh, make room for the promise. And sometimes that's a physical room that you have to actually make room, you know, in your life, whether it's time or physical space. There's things that you may have to do or rearrange, you know, to welcome the promise of God into your life. And so it took time and it took expense. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's it right. It took really getting into the material. Mm -hmm. Uh, some people just want to stay in the prophetic. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You and don't want to get down in the That can be easy to do, you know. Um, hearing from God and having visions is really, oh, is really exciting, you yeah. know, and it's exciting for everyone. Um, but there is a point where our faith has to join with that word and has to uh, become active, you know, in our lives and to, to realize and accept that promise into our lives. Th this is a Bible story. I want you to know that. I, I've been through wow. Sunday school. This, this would fit very much. Uh, we're out of time, but guess what? He's going to be with us tomorrow. You, you've got to hear the rest of this story. As I said at the top of the show, th there's so many parts, moving parts to this story. There's a lot of, you know, spiritual lessons and there's a lot of that nitty-gritty of getting on airplanes and going to foreign countries. They're not quite as clean as America and all those things. But you've got to hear the rest of it, so don't miss the next program. Uh, it's, it's very important because I believe that in the end they adopted some world changers. Uh, this is where you really put your faith on the line uh, to obey God. So be sure you're with us next time. And remember, there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. I think he proves that. See you next time. If you should miss a Homekeepers program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTN Programs and then on Homekeepers.